Good afternoon. I want to uh, thank my colleague Sarah for standing in on Friday. She did a great job. I missed you all tremendously. Uh, <laughs> now that I've realized that we can do that a little more, I'll spend a little more time at the Pentagon. Um, move this up a little bit. I appreciate your uh, flexibility today so that the pool has enough time to cover uh, the Vice President and Secretary Shulkin as they welcome uh, Honor Flight veterans to Washington on the anniversary of VE Day. Uh, the Vice President is hosting more than 120 veterans of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War as part of National Military Appreciation Month and Public Service Recognition Week, highlighting the Trump administration's commitment to our military and public service. Uh, and with that, I'd be glad to take a few questions. Kristen. John, thank you. Former President Obama warned then-President-elect Trump against hiring Mike Flynn as his national security advisor. Why did he ignore that warning? Well, I. I the President doesn't disclose details of meetings that he has, which in this case was an hour-long meeting, but it's true that the President made it, President Obama made it known that he wasn't exactly a fan of General Flynn's, uh, which is frankly shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that given that General Flynn had worked for President Obama, was an outspoken critic of President Obama's shortcomings, specifically as it related to his lack of strategy confronting ISIS and other threats around. Uh, that, that we're facing America. So the, the question that you have to ask yourself really is if President Obama was truly concerned about General Flynn, why didn't he suspend General Flynn's security clearance, which they had just reapproved months earlier? Additionally, why did the Obama administration let Flynn go to Russia for a paid speaking engagement and receive a fee? I mean, there were steps that they could have taken that if, they, if that was truly a concern more than just a person uh, that, that didn't had bad blood. And I want to follow up on a couple of points because you raised the security clearance. But before that, if if a sitting president raises the name of one individual, why wouldn't that give the president elect pause? I understand what you're saying, the caveats about the fact that he campaigned against Hillary Clinton, et cetera. But wouldn't that give the incoming president pause? Well, I, I think I, I would not know that I agree with your characterization. You made it clear that he wasn't a fan of his. And I don't think that should have come as a surprise considering the role that General Flynn paid. Uh, played in the campaign, criticizing his. You didn't give him any pause at all. No, I, I, I think again. I think you, you, if you know what we knew at the time, which is that the security clearance that he had had been reapproved in April of that year, um, and they took not only did they reapprove it, uh, but then they took no steps to su suspend it. So the question has to be: What did they do if they had real concerns beyond just not having, you know, not liking him for some of the comments that he made? And it's our understanding, and if you could clarify this. Did Mike Flynn not need upgraded security clearance in order to serve as the national security advisor? Oh, he'd been head of the de Defense Intelligence Agency. That's the but same. You vetted him as well, correct? But that's the same clearance that the, the security clearance, we went over this a while ago, is the same clearance at any level. Once you get it, you get it for the time that you had. He had had his reinvestigation in April of 2016, um, and the Obama administration took no steps. Not only did they reaffirm that security clearance, they took no steps uh, to suspend it or take any other action. But did you not vet him yourselves? Well, you don't vet on a security clearance. That, that's, what, that's why you get a security clearance. Everyone in the government goes through the same process. So the answer is that those same, uh, that same process worked for General Flynn as it did for me or for anyone else who works here. Um, there's no difference of, of a security clearance once it's issued. Zeke. Thanks, Sean. You said a few minutes ago, uh, Christian. Um, what we know is what we knew at the time. So does knowing what the White House knows now, does the White House, does the President believe that General Flynn should not have had that clearance reissued last year, number one? And number two, does the White House believe that General Flynn was truthful when he filled out uh, his SF-86 for that reinvestigation last year? Well, I'm not going to get into those to those details. It was Obviously, that was something that was adjudicated by the Obama administration uh, in April of 2016. They took no steps to, to, uh, to suspend that. Um, so that's not really a question for us. It's a question for them at that time. No, knowing what you know now, that's in the public record. Yeah, I think record. the president took appropriate action when he did, once he felt as though uh, General Flynn had uh, misled the vice president, and he, uh, he took appropriate and decisive action at the time, and he stands by that today. Did his, did his ties to Russia, did his, did his work as, uh, as a registered foreign agent, now registered foreign agent for the government of Turkey, lead to his firing in, in February? Well, again, I, I don't think we're going to re-litigate this. The president made the right decision back then, and he stands by that. Hunter. 
Thank you, Sean. Um, last week, officials indicated the Pentagon planned to send the president a proposal to send several thousand additional troops to Afghanistan. Um, can you confirm whether or not the president has made a decision about sending additional troops to Afghanistan? And if so, when are they going, how many are going, and what is their mission? Yeah, I, I'll refer you to the Department of Defense on that. Uh, they are in contact with them, but I, we have nothing to, to share at this time. Sarah. Thanks, John. Um, the President tweeted this morning that senators on the Intelligence Committee should ask Sally Yates about her role in classified leaks about General Flynn. Does the President have evidence that ties Sally Yates to the Flynn leaks? Why did he tweet that? Well, I think you guys uh, are well aware of the President's concern about spills of, of uh, classified and other sensitive information out into the open. Uh, it's something that should concern every American, and the President's made it very clear uh, for since, his, since he took office, that, that that's a big concern of his. Um, and so the idea that classified information made its way into the press is something that I think, while we're asking all of these questions, is one of the ones that I think the Senator should ask. How did that information um, get, get out into the, to the open like that? I think that is an equally important question that, frankly, isn't getting asked. Does the President believe that Sally Yates was the leaker in this? Specific? Again, I think that the, the tweet speaks for itself. What he's saying is that the Senate should ask those questions. Yeah. Uh, Sean, aside from the announcement today that uh, the President will nominate 10 judges to fill federal vacancies, many conservatives remain concerned the White House is woefully behind on overall appointments. The President recently told the examiner, paraphrasing, that he doesn't need to fill vacant posts in the administration. After and, and, and after these 10, there will still be 110 judicial uh, vacancies. Does the President still believe vacant administration jobs do not need to be filled? And are there any plans to increase the pace of political appointments? Uh, so there's like three questions in there. I'll try to break them down. Um, number one, uh, we have a very robust schedule of releasing uh, names. There is a method to this in terms of the the, the, the nominees that are getting put out now, and I think you should expect to see more and more go through. The process this time around is a little bit different. We're actually going through uh, the Office of Government Ethics and FBI clearances before announcing most of these individuals. And so there's a little bit of a difference in how we're doing this, but we are well on pace uh, with respect to many of these to get the government up and running. But the President's point that he was making in that interview was that part of the review of government is to make sure that we're looking at these positions and figuring out whether or not we have the, the taxpayers getting the best bang for their buck, both in terms of productivity and cost. And so we're looking through the entire government. Director Mulvaney, I think, briefed you all a while ago about how we look at, relook at government and figure out whether or not uh, we can do a better job of filling positions, of staffing the government. Uh, but we're going to continue to have announcements on key positions as, as the week goes by control to the bureaucracy if you don't fill some of no, these no, We are, and I, that's what I'm saying. I think that you're going to continue to see whether it's judicial nominations, ambassadors, other key positions. I think we're, the, we have a very healthy clip uh, of announcements that continue to go out. Trey. Thanks, Sean. Ahead of her testimony today, does President Trump believe Sally Yates is a trustworthy source of information? Well, that's not up for us to decide. I mean, that is up to the Senate to decide whether or not what she what she does, and we'll late, we'll have to wait and see what that. And, and following up on Sarah's question, it seemed that the president was implying that Sally Yates may have had something to do with the leaked information to newspapers. Is that what he was implying? Well, I think the tweet speaks for itself. I don't think sometimes you don't have to read too much into it, Richard. Thank you, uh, Sean. Two questions on NAFTA. First, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister on Friday said that they're considering, as a reaction to what he, the Prime Minister calls an unfair punitive uh, duty on Canadian softwood lumber, right. considering banning coal imports from the U.S. Uh, is it the beginning of a trade war between Canada and the U.S.? No. That's why we have dispute settlement mechanisms uh, to, to do this in a, in a responsible way. Uh, the, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, uh, has been in touch with his counterparts over there. And I think, look, we, we've there's a reason that, that the dispute mechanism is set up the way that it is under uh, this particular trade agreement, but under most trade agreements, so that uh, the two parties can resolve them in, in a way that uh, allows for both sides to air their concerns. But that, that's why you have an agreement, and that's why you have a mechanism set up to do that. So you trust the mechanism on this? No, no, we'll, we'll, let, let's let it play out. But I think Secretary Ross uh, took appropriate action to protect a U.S. industry. Uh, and we're going to let the process play out. And 10 days ago, the President said that uh, Mexico and Canada had agreed to uh, fasten the process to reno renegotiate NAFTA. What has, has happened in the last 10 days? Well, I think our officials will start to. We'll have further updates for you on that. Right now, there's, there's no, nothing to share. John. 
Thanks a lot, Sean. Did Sally Yates have to run any of her planned testimony by the General Counsel's Office <clears throat> that she'll deliver later this afternoon? I'm not aware of it, no. And also, um, do you have any reason to doubt that uh, her testimony, which will be under oath, will be truthful before the Senate uh, subcommittee? I, I have no, I mean, no. I, I would assume that when you raise your right hand and uh, agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth that you'll you'll do that. That's the whole reason that you pledge. Francesca. Thank you, Sean. For weeks during the transition, President Trump was not receiving a daily intelligence briefing. He was receiving his information from General Flynn. Do you think that lack of direct information from the intelligence com community contributed to um, the lapse in vetting with General Flynn? So first, uh, he did get his, I mean, we, we extensively went over the, the PBD briefing uh, throughout the campaign. I believe back then it was three times a week that he was getting it, and then he supplanted by his national security team. They would go in and do that. So I, I don't. I think the premise is not there. Secondly, as I mentioned to Kristen, the, the processes uh, that were followed by General Flynn were followed are followed by every government employee who receives a clearance at that particular level. Uh, and, sorry, sorry. Uh, on another thing, I wanted to talk about the signing statement that came out on Friday with the spending bill. Uh, Senior administration officials, including Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, didn't seem to know about that. Why didn't she or people working on that issue know about that, know it was coming? Whose idea was that? And uh, what happened between when Sarah was out here on Friday saying that she didn't think there was going to be something like that and then close a business when there was a signing statement? And did you know it was coming? So signing statements are a pro forma um activity that occurs during a bill sign that's performed by the Department of Justice Office of the Legislative Council. It's been used by every president. So I'm not really sure what, what everyone knew, but that is a that is something that goes along going back multiple administrations. So can I follow Thanks, with that on HBCUs Cecilia, from that Cecilia, signing statement, Cecilia. please? Thanks, Sean. Uh, on the travel ban, a couple questions if I may. Um, Back in February, the president said that lifting the travel ban would mean that many bad and dangerous people would be pouring in. Have you seen any evidence that that's been the case in the three months since this ban was lifted? I think that's a question for the Department of Homeland Security. Well, that's something you've been tracking. No, I, I personally know, but well, I, I'd be glad to follow up with the Department of Homeland Security. I don't have anything at this time. Okay, on, on this, in the same vein. Um, if, if, if this White House is no longer calling this a Muslim ban, as the president did initially, why does the president's website still explicitly call for, quote, preventing Muslim immigration? And it says Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Uh, I'm not aware of what's on the campaign website. But you'd have to ask them. I know how we've talked about this from the first day of this administration as a travel ban that's in this country's uh, national security <coughs> interest to make sure that people who are coming in here are coming in here with the right motives and reasons that we're having a public safety aspect to making sure that we're protecting our people. I think that's, we've, we've been very consistent since the first day of this administration on this. Is to it worth getting here, though, and, and completely disavowing the use of that phrase, Muslim ban? I mean, <coughs> if it's still on the website, if the president's words are being used against him in court today, is it worth you clarifying that once I, I, and for all? I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why I would, I've been very clear. I don't think I need to clarify what, what we have said or what the president well, said. Since it's coming up in court. And that's I, I understand that, and that's years. frankly one of the reasons that we, we have uh, concerns about how that's being interpreted, because I think the intent uh, of the travel ban was very clear. I think the it was uh, something that the president made very clear in the filings that we have filed, uh, why he did it, the motives for doing it, and he was very clear when he spoke about it from the beginning. So there really shouldn't be any question as to why the president's doing this and the, the idea of making sure that we're putting the safety of our country and our people first and foremost. Okay. So, Thank you. I've got two topics, hopefully fast. Okay. Um, so the Kushner family was in China making a pitch for the uh, EB-5 visa program. This came a day after the president signed the omnibus, which of course extended that program without any changes. So two questions on that. One, is it a violation of the conflict of interest agreement that Jared Kushner came to? Um, and also, um, does the president believe that that investor visa program needs to be modified in any yeah. way? So I think uh, I would refer you to the to the company on that. I don't. But this had Jared has done everything to comply with the ethics uh, 
rules to make sure and that had nothing to do with him per se. He wasn't involved. And secondly, I think we've talked about this before, that the President and Congress are looking entire at, at how to look over the entire visa program, all the various visa programs, and whether or not they are serving the purpose that they were intended to, whether or not uh, we're making sure that we do what's in the best interest of the American worker. Uh, and so we're going to continue to work with Congress on that. Okay. And uh, regarding uh, the Opioid Commission, it's my understanding that no members of that commission have been named yet. We're more than 30 days into what was supposed to be a 90-day period for that commission to come back with a report to the president. Uh, what's up with that, and does that send the wrong signal to people who believe that this is a very urgent crisis where, like, more than 100 people are dying every day? Right. Well, let me get back to you on the on the exact uh, names and the announcement on that. I've got a, a follow-up with that. I think when it comes to the opioid crisis, the president both during the campaign, the transition, and now as President, has made it very clear of his commitment to figuring out how we can address this crisis that plagues so many, um, so many uh, neighborhoods and communities. And he'll continue to uh, work with, you know, he appointed Governor Christie in a, in a bipartisan commission. So as soon as we have additional uh, information on that, um, so uh, we will do that. Why is it important for the president to get these 10 individuals out there to serve the country? And on a more broader perspective of this question, there are a number of vacancies, 129 going into the day, uh, to say nothing of some of the openings over there in the EOB that I'm sure could still be filled. The pace seems slow. Is the president aware of that pace? Is he comfortable with the pace? And what's the White House doing, not just to fill those important judicial jobs, but others that are related yeah. to the administration? So on the judicial jobs, obviously, we're going through it in a very methodical way. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, there's a lot of uh, background that goes on in each of these in terms of the Office of Government and Ethics, the FBI background check that goes on. And so they're all in the pipeline. I think you'll continue to see a very robust about of announcements on not just the judicial front, but on several of the fronts. And we're really, we, we've been tracking where we are. I think we're well in, uh, on pace with where previous administrations have been, some ahead, some a little behind. Uh, but we're doing a great job of filling those key positions and making sure that we get the right person for the right job. Sean. 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 I want to ask you a big, a big picture question about Afghanistan. You were asked about troop levels, and you don't have an answer to that. But last week, the uh, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction painted a very grim picture. Uh, security incidents through March reached the highest level in a decade. Civilian casualties were the highest on record. There's rampant drug use in Afghanistan. So as the President weighs this request for more troops, what, what, what's going to be his ultimate goal? Is it going to be stability? Is it outright victory in the 16th, 17th year of this war? Well, I think, number one, he wants to make sure that we defeat ISIS. Uh, that is something that uh, is in our national security interest, make sure that we protect our people. Uh, but do, does so in a very responsible, smart way. I mean, he's talked about not projecting, um, you know, where where he's going and what he's going to do to let the enemy know ahead of time. And part of that uh, guidance and that his national security team is giving him are, are different pieces that you're talking about. How do we achieve those key outcomes? How do we do what's in the country's best interest and utilize our our military and uh, and our treasure to the best of our ability. That is something that we're continuing to work on and do, um, and that's part of what he is getting briefed on and, and, and is implementing. It's um, So I'm not entirely sure if that answers what you're going, but that is that is what he has been getting briefed on, and that is the kind of decision-making process that is currently underway. Is the President displeased with the current state of affairs in Afghanistan? Well, I think he wants to make sure that we do what we can to win, and that's why he charged the generals. Uh, and other military advisors and national security team to come up with a plan uh, that can get us there. So, Ronica. Sean, Sean, thank you. Does the president believe that health care is a right or a product? Well, I think the president's been very clear uh, in his statements that whether or not you call it a right or not, he wants every person to have access to health care that covers pre existing conditions, that is affordable. And I think the steps that he's taken over the last week in the bill that he's implemented, that he, he worked to pass through the House, clearly um, highlight those priorities. He wants to make sure that people have access to care. He is concerned when he hears about companies uh, leaving the marketplace and not giving consumers a choice. He is concerned when he hears about deductibles going through the roof, costs going through the roof, and people not having the access that they can to health care. Um, and he is very concerned that we are facing a, a choice right now where Obamacare is failing and dying, and that if we don't act, that people won't have access to health care and they won't be able to afford it. And so the steps that he is taking uh, 
um, are to achieve those principles that he's laid out. Blake. Uh, two questions as it relates to uh, President Trump and former President Obama. Back to that November conversation, were there specific reasons given? And if so, as, as it relates to Michael Flynn, and if so, was that based on private information? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I know that, like I said, um, he passed along exactly what I mentioned to Kristen at the outset. And that, that's, and that's all. Sean, 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 secondly. Sean, secondly. Michael. Two, two clarifications. On the signing statements, broadly, not just the subject of the HBCUs, um, are you saying that the president was not aware of that very long, of the details of that very long signing statement? It was just something done at, at OLC? And no, no, no. That's not, I, that's not, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the president's obviously aware of what happened. The question that was asked is, it is a process. It, it, it has happened for administrations going back, generations, I'm sure, I don't have this precise nature of when signing statements came into to being, but this is a, a normal pro forma piece that goes along with, with, um, with a bill signing to make sure that the executive branch's intent uh, is as understood. But a lot of the things that were in that signing statement were things that were essentially carryovers from things that Obama had also objected to. Um, and so, right. but, but the president and the senior staff here was aware of what those things were and approved those of course, things being yes. Okay. Second question on the uh, Flynn and the security clearances. You, you guys have made both from the podium here and also the president made a big deal of this question of the Obama people uh, gave him the clearance or re-upped the clearance right. earlier. Um, are you suggesting now, knowing what you guys know with, the, with, with hindsight and whatever, are you saying that they should have, you believe that the Obama administration should have denied him his clearance back in April based on the information that, that you're now aware of connections with Russia, et cetera, et cetera, are you suggesting that they should have denied it? No, what I'm suggesting is is that you can't have it both ways. The, the folks who are coming out and saying Obama, you know, expressed some concern about Flynn, well, number one, it was pretty expected. This is a guy who uh, was very outspoken in his criticism of, of President Obama's policies. So the idea that President Obama, uh, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't like the guy doesn't seem shocking. But the point that you have to ask yourself is if you – if the Obama administration, or under the Obama administration, if they reissued a high, that one of the highest security clearances that you can get, knowing what they knew then, and then didn't do anything to take a proactive steps to suspend it in any way, shape, or form, the question you have to ask yourself is, if they were concerned, why didn't they take any steps? We, they're the ones who had, at that point, all the access and all the knowledge to everything that was on his SF-86 security clearance, not us. So if President Obama or anyone else, frankly, in the government was concerned, the question should be asked, what did they do? And if nothing, then why not if they really truly were concerned? I think that is a fair question. Dave, Sean, Dave, Sean, Dave, Dave, Sean, Dave, Sean, Sean, Dave, Sean, Dave, Dave. Over the weekend, General, Sean, over the weekend, uh, North Korea uh, detained the fourth U.S. citizen uh, are you, are you concerned that they're trying to escalate tensions even further? Do you consider these Americans hostages? And what are you doing diplomatically, back channel or otherwise, to try and get them released? Yeah, I, obviously this is concerning. Uh, we're well aware of it. Uh, and we're going to work through the Embassy of Sweden that has a facility in North Korea, or an embassy in North Korea, uh, through our State Department to seek the release of the individuals there. But I would refer you to the State Department on that. Sean, sure, thanks very much. Um, just to follow up on your answer on Afghanistan, you mentioned ISIS, but you didn't mention the Taliban. Should we read that to mean no, that no. the focus will be on ISIS? No, it's, well? it's to defeat both the ISIS and Taliban. Uh, I mean, there's no, it's, it's to make sure that we put our national security interests first uh, and defeat all of those. Uh, see, folks that seek to do us harm. Are you willing to negotiate with the Taliban? I, I, look, let's. I think right now the whole point of this is the president is receiving uh, a plan and guidance from his national security team, as he had asked for. Uh, that guidance is coming forward um, as we speak. He's continuing to meet with them, um, and there will be further updates from the Department of Defense as we move forward. The, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, the president or the vice president has an event. I want to make sure the pool has time to set for it. We're around all afternoon. I will take care. Good to see you. Thank you. President Obama, was he right about Michael